Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about CD, DVD, and Blu-ray technology. These are three ways of storing digital data on disks, like we can see here. We know, of course, that there's a bit of a difference between each sort of disk, and in particular, the amount of data that we can store in each sort of disk. So let's go into exactly how they work. Now, all three sorts of disks are storage media, that is, a medium in which we can store data. Right? And they're all, they all have roughly the same shape, which we can see over here. They consist of basically a metal reflective layer between two plastic layers. The bottom layer is clear polycarbonate, it's labeled over here. The top layer is a sort of protective acrylic layer that's made of transparent plastic. And in the middle, we have a reflective metal layer. And it's this layer on which the data is stored. The shape of the data that we store is a spiral-shaped groove a little bit like the old LP vinyl records. So we store the data in a spiral that starts in the middle and moves outwards through the disk. So to store sound information on a disk, we first have to digitize it. So we break it into samples, we assign a number to each sample, and then we convert that number into binary. So in order to write the information onto a disk, whether it's a CD, a DVD, or a Blu-ray disk, we need to use a laser to burn little pits into the reflective layer of the disk. Each sort of disk uses a different sort of laser, and so the pits are different sizes. If we have a pit on the disk, it represents a one. If we have a lack of a pit, that represents a zero. If we've turned everything into a series of ones and zeros, then we can burn that to a CD with a sequence of pits and not pits. Depending on what the data is, the sequence of pits and not pits will be different. Now the amount of data that we can fit onto the disk depends on the number of pits and not pits we can have on it. We have a close-up of CD over here. We can see that there are lots of little dots representing each pit. So CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs all use a different size for their pits, which means that they can fit different amounts of pits on each disk. And this, of course, is why they store different amounts of data. If we have a large amount of data, then we need, we need a large number of ones and zeros to represent it. And that means a large number of pits and not pits, which we might be, not be able to fit onto a single disk if the pits and not pits are very large. So let's take a look at each different sort of disk. We'll start off with the CD, or the compact disk. So the CD, when we're burning the little pits and not pits into it, uses a wavelength of 780 nanometers for a laser that does the burning. This corresponds to a, an infrared light laser, so we can use this to read or write data to the disk. When we burn music onto a CD, we use a sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz, that is 44,100 samples per second. Quite a few samples, right? So uh, when we look at the amount of data that we can store, this equates to 75 minutes of uncompressed music or about 650 megabytes of data. Of course, if we take music and compress it using various different compression algorithms, we can end up making the tracks much smaller than 650 megabytes. Of course, if we did that, we wouldn't be able to convert the signals back into music quite so easily. Our next disc is the DVD, or Digital Versatile Disc. So a DVD doesn't use an infrared laser. It uses a laser with a little bit more energy, a red laser with a wavelength of 656 nanometers. This higher energy laser is why you can't burn a DVD using a CD burner. It's the wrong sort of laser. Because we are using a much smaller wavelength, we can write smaller pits and smaller not pits and have smaller distances between them and end up having more data on the disk than for a CD. So this means that they can store 4.7 gigabytes of data, which is four hours worth of high quality video. This is why we often get videos stored digitally on DVDs. In a movie on a DVD, sound tends to be sampled at a rate of 192 kilohertz, which is much higher quality than the sound sampled on a CD. If we look at the Blu-ray disc, this has an even shorter wavelength for the laser, and so an even more powerful laser. The wavelength is about 405 nanometers, which as you can see is much smaller, a much shorter wavelength than the laser for a DVD or for a CD. So this means that it can carry up to about 25 gigabytes of data. And that's without doing things like multi-layering 
or other tricks like that. So already this is about five times as much as a DVD can hold. And because we can hold so much data, we can use it to use in order to have higher definition movies. That is, we can cut the movies into smaller slices, more pixels, more frames. We use the same sound quality as DVDs because, to be quite honest, 192 kilohertz is high enough quality for anyone. It does mean that we can store higher quality video data and we can store more of it than a DVD can. So how exactly do we read from a CD if we're a CD player? Well, it has to do with how lasers will bounce off these pits. We can see a diagram of an extreme close-up of a CD and a laser trying to reflect from the disc. When we play the CD, we shine a laser onto the surface of the disc. We do this for each little section that could be a pit or a non-pit. And we can see that if a laser strikes a flat part of the disc, it will bounce straight back up. We can have a detector here at the top to receive the light. If the detector goes off, then we know that the CD must be flat, and that counts as a zero. On the other hand, if we fire a laser into the place where, we, where we're looking at on the disc, and we don't reach the receiver, it's because we've struck a pit. So when we strike a, one of the tiny pits on the disc, the laser scatters, and this represents a one. So by having a series of not pits and pits, we can encode a series of zeros and ones. Once we have all the ones and zeros, we can feed those to a digital to analog converter, which will change them back into an analog signal. It might look something like this. So this will reconstruct, by using these different samples, the wave that we started off with. Just by putting all these samples together and reconstructing the wave that must have been used to produce those samples. Once we have that reconstructed wave, we can put it through a loudspeaker. So we can amplify the voltage to a speaker and produce the sound. And if we have a high number of samples, like 44.1 thousand samples per second, then the reproduction of the sound is very, very similar to the sound that we started off with. DVDs and Blu-ray discs are read by lasers of different wavelengths. They are about on the same scale as the wavelengths that are used to burn the data into the disk to start with. So the data they contain is going to be much more densely packed because we use smaller pits and smaller not pits. And we tend to encode video as well, which is harder to encode and is much more bulky in terms of the amount of data than sound data. Remember that when we encode a movie, we're encoding it at about 25 frames per second. Each frame contains thousands and thousands of pixels, and each pixel is a certain number of bytes. So that means every frame of the movie takes up a large number of bytes, and every second of the movie takes up a large number of frames. So every second of video data stored on a DVD takes up a large amount of ones and zeros, which means that we need to figure out clever ways to pack it all in. So if we have a DVD or a Blu-ray player, then it means that we need to have a computer or a miniature computer embedded inside a player in order to decode all the information and turn all the ones and zeros back into both sound and video data. So that's the end of this section. In this section we've learned about DVDs, CDs, and Blu-ray discs and how they encode and store data.